Hello and welcome to today's vlog exploring issues regarding memory loss, litigation and capacity. I'm Laura Murphy, um, an Associate Solicitor at Lee Day and I'll hand you over to my colleagues to introduce themselves. Thanks Laura, um, I'm Bethany Sanders, I'm a partner at, at Lee Day in the personal injury department. Um, I've acted for numerous clients who've sustained uh, brain injuries and uh, I am, and as, uh, as Laura is, uh, an APIL accredited uh, brain injury specialist lawyer. Uh, we represent uh, injured claimants uh, in personal injury proceedings uh, resulting from um, injuries that have been um, sustained in various different circumstances, such as uh, road traffic collisions, uh, workplace injuries, uh, or if uh, somebody has been involved um, in, in instance in, in various other uh, situations. Um, I'm going to head, hand over to Charlotte Dyson, who will introduce herself as well. Thank you, Beth. So my name's Charlotte, I'm from another law firm called Wrigley's. Um, I'm a sister in their Court of Protection and Personal Injury Trust team. Um, I'm also a director of our trust corporation, um, Wrigley's Trustees Limited. Um, and within that corporation, I act as attorney, uh, deputy and trustee. Um, I assist a, a lot of our clients, uh, those that have been involved in accidents, as, as Beth has just explained, and sustained uh, brain injuries, amongst other uh, catastrophic injuries. Um, and I've also assisted and do assist uh, in role as deputy and trustee those that have a mental health diagnosis or diagnosis such as dementia. Thank you both. So I thought it would be useful, first of all, to think about um, whether memory loss is a, is a common symptom um, experienced by the clients that we deal with day to day. Um, Charlotte, I don't know if you want to, to start with, with talking about your experience. Uh, yes, yeah, as I've just mentioned, a lot of our clients have, have been involved in accidents or incidents of, of, of ne clinical negligence and have uh, sustained um, brain injuries. Um, obviously, and part of those uh, symptoms are memory loss. Um, so we, we see a range of, of memory loss due to, to the injuries clients have sustained. Um, we also see memory loss due to um, infections such as UTIs, which are obviously common um, when our clients are in hospital or for a number of reasons that can cause uh, temporary uh, memory loss uh, and of course our clients uh, often do have obviously pre-existing um, diagnoses such as mental health and some of those uh, symptoms surrounding those diagnoses can be memory loss. Um, dementia is also obviously um, a key factor obviously sometimes as to why we become involved especially as attorney and deputy um, and obviously a big factor of Alzheimer's and the like is, is memory loss. Mm -hmm. And, and some, Beth and I also um, see it's, it's, you know, it's one of many symptoms, obviously, are after brain injury, but it, it does appear to be one of the most common. Um, I think we, we were saying before, Beth, weren't we, that um, it's very unusual not to, to see um, this as an issue for someone who's sustained a, a moderate to severe brain injury as an issue. Yes. Yeah, almost it, it's, it, uh, across the board. I think we, we see clients who um, can't remember the actual uh, incident itself uh, or for, for a large period uh, before and after um, the post-traumatic amnesia um, of, of varying degrees. But there, there is, uh, with brain injury, almost always uh, an element of memory loss. Whether there continues to be ongoing memory loss um, uh, once they've recovered from that uh, acute um, injury. Um, does does vary but it, it's certainly something that we we see very very commonly mm. yeah and I suppose in my role I suppose taking on, on from litigation we, we sometimes do see where memory loss does improve like you say after the initial acute period so I have seen memory loss improve um over the years we act as deputy and trustee but, it, but you're quite right sometimes it, it can continue and it does vary mm -hmm. And because it's such um, a big issue and something we're all seeing so so regularly, obviously it has a big impact on on people's day to day life. And I'd be really interested, um, Charlotte, to hear how you see from your perspective how it impacts on clients' day to day function and their independence, and and, and you know what that's like for them. Uh, yes, uh, obviously, particularly in our role, because our role particularly focused on property and affairs. So where we're appointed as property and affairs um, attorney or, or particularly deputy, 
um, it impacts them considerably from a property and affairs perspective insofar as memory impacts their financial independence. Um, so we often see that they obviously, they lose that independence to some extent because they forget to pay bills. Um, you know, that they're not monitoring their finances um, as much, um, they're forgetting things. And then obviously that can lean in, lead inadvertently to a vulnerability uh, regarding financial and being financially exploited. Uh, and sometimes obviously that can result in, in fraud um, and issues. So obviously our role is key to protect uh, them from that financial vulnerability, especially if they are forgetting and, and they have issues regarding their memory. Definitely, yeah. And, and Beth, you were talking about a client in particular who's, who struck you as with having really severe, severe memory issues. Yeah, um, I recently represented uh, a lady who was involved in um, a road traffic collision. She was crossing the road and struck by a car. Um, sustained a severe brain injury and was uh, was in hospital for, for a long period afterwards. Um, it, this wasn't one of the, the cases where uh, it, it's kind of borderline. This was quite clear cut that she did require um, some some assistance with uh, with managing her, her affairs and the litigation. Um, but it, it was just quite, um, quite interesting as, as part of our role, we will um, uh, collect information from various people about somebody's capacity and um, through talking to her sister who, who uh, she lived with um, it was it was really interesting and very helpful for us to, to establish that she did um, require some assistance because um, this was something which was challenged by the defendants even though it seemed fairly clear-cut it was quite important that we got information from um, from those around her about day-to-day -day examples of, of the challenges um, that she faced um, and uh, how that impeded her independence. Um, one, of the, um, one of the striking features, um, which is not by any means unique, um, but she uh, had retained intelligence. There was no issue about, um, about her ability to kind of understand things, but that the memory problem was was very uh, acute, and it meant that uh, she she really struggled with uh, what were on the face of it um, uh, straightforward uh, things that we all undertake in day to day life without really thinking about it. Um, so one of the examples of that was that um, uh, her sister would report that she would uh, often put things in the oven and forget about them. Um, and that was compounded by the fact that she had also lost her sense of smell uh, in in the injury, which again is 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 not uncommon. Um, but that those two um, two in, uh, symptoms combined actually meant that she did require a, a quite a lot of kind of supervision and, and needed uh, a lot of support to ensure that she was safe. Um, so it, we did end up um, getting some some support in um, to ensure that she was she was okay to be um, to, to be undertaking these things without risk to her to herself. Uh, but she'd often uh, also do things like um, go to the to the shops with her support worker, but uh, forget her pin number or uh, would uh, forget to um, to forget to take her card out of the machine. She was also vulnerable to um, to exploitation with the potential for her to lend money to people and then forget about it, that kind of thing, which again is is, is fairly uh, common amongst our client groups. Um, she, uh, other safety issues caused by the memory problems were, um, were leaving the door open or forgetting to, to lock it. Um, and uh, and, and these, these things in, in combination, whilst uh, may not seem grave on, on their own, actually, it was the cumulative effect of, of her memory problems, which actually meant that she, she did really struggle um, day to day. And that was something that uh, was really helpful information that we, we obtained as part of the litigation process. Mm, they're both all very, very sort of, um, as you say, they seem like small things, but actually impact day to day. Um, so as solicitors acting for, for people who, who have these type of difficulties and issues, um, it's interesting to reflect on the type of strategies and tools we can put into place to actually support those people and their families and, and actually help them um, with what can be some quite complex information um, in, in the litigation or, or other legal situations. And 
one of the things that that we do um, in litigation is look to see if a litigation friend is required um, and that's a person usually either a close family member or a friend who can actually step into the shoes of the client if they can't make decisions for themselves and actually make decisions in their best interests in the claim as I say sometimes some quite complex decisions um, and although we do try to still involve the brain injured person to the extent that we can if, they're, if we're able to we actually have to take instructions from that litigation friend um, and if that if that person has absolutely nobody at all who would be suitable for that that role then there is actually um, a, a, an official solicitor um, a government appointed person who can actually make decisions for a person with that, who does who lacks capacity instead um, and one of the other things we do um, as, as soon as we possibly can is is look to instruct a specialist um, brain injury uh, specialist case manager and that's someone who can pull together the team of therapists and actually put in place um, really essential therapies that someone who sustained a brain injury requires and for example um, they're really uh, memory issues are really frustrating for the person and something that they they've got to come to terms with and so someone like a neuropsychologist can actually help educate and, and explain to that person why they're having these memory issues and actually help them come up with um, coping strategies um, and occupational therapists can help with things like um, memory aids that type of thing so they're, they're some of the very early things we try to put in place in the litigation um, to, to support people as much as we can um, Charlotte I don't know uh, what, what sort of other things you do I'm sure we have lots of other strategies and, and tools yourself uh, yes um, so so in line of what you just you've just said there um, where for instance we are appointed I am appointed as, as property and affairs deputy we will of course work closely with, with you um, as, as the litigation team like you say if a case manager is appointed and there's a multidisciplinary team that involves the OT and so on we, as, as a deputy we would work very closely with that support network um, to all work closely together to to assist that client um, from our perspective from a, a property and affairs financial perspective we will coordinate with you to ensure that we're delivering any information or advice from a financial perspective um, in the best possible way and that may mean that um, we're using those aids like you say those memory aids that are usually purchased during the litigation or even when lit you know the litigation has ended we, we, we will purchase it at, from, as a deputy ongoing and that like you say could be a smartphone with a calendar it could be an ipad could be an organizer anything that the client requires and is more helpful to them a wall chart um, and we would work with to deliver any information and to support them you know you have to look at the routine the best time of day to deliver information and speak with them when they're fresh and alert um, so if, if it's something financial we need to explain to them about perhaps using their their card or providing them with a payment we'll try and make sure that we've coordinated with the the mdt team um, to deliver that information to them possibly in a morning that's the best time for them or possibly in the afternoon if they're not good in a morning um, we make sure that you know the client is aware that we may be calling or, or coming to meet them i appreciate in these times it's it's more likely to be a virtual meeting mm -hmm. um, but we'll remind them that we're calling or meeting to make sure that it's it doesn't cause them confusion in their day-to-day -day routine um, will deliver probably other key pieces of information if that is best for them we have to gauge like you do in terms of memory loss and capacity how much information they can they can take on board at a particular time so it may be that we give them a key piece of advice or information on one occasion and if something is not so pressing we may leave further information till another call or another meeting mm -hmm. um, because it may be too much at that particular time and that is in line with breaking the information down into chunks and, and manageable uh, pieces of information which i appreciate from your perspective as, as liaising with litigation friend that's a similar way as to what you would do as well yeah definitely. um repeating again you you'll see that in, in your line from litigation repeating the information so whether that's following up in writing 
in your your area i'm assuming via the litigation friend as well but keeping yeah. keeping the claimant in the loop um you know following up in writing it may be that it's just bullet points of information we will do a similar similar thing from a deputyship point of view um following up in writing maybe follow up in a call in a day or so um or revisiting something in the following week probably liaising with the neuropsychologist depending on the information that we we need to deliver yeah yeah that makes sense. Beth, did you want to add anything? Yeah, sorry. I, I, in terms of the strategies we use, we yeah. I, I guess we, we'd echo a lot of what, what Charlotte said uh, in terms of making sure that um, things were repeated, followed up in writing, uh, broken down into bite-sized bite chunks, um, and uh, use uh, simplified language wherever we can. Obviously, uh, throughout the litigation, there may be points where we need to explain really quite complex and, and uh, and difficult um, legal uh, legal concepts such as um, how the damages are to be paid, whether that's in lump sum or then annual payments, periodical payments. Um, and uh, there are lots of, uh, of issues and, and things like life expectancy that, that, that play a part in, in these decisions. Um, and uh, things like the discount rate, which again is another very complex uh, legal um, uh, uh, legal uh, legal issue that is, is very hard for even people that don't have memory issues to to try and understand so uh, that's why when it's it, it really is um, very important that we've we've got a litigation friend or somebody that can support uh, the uh, the injured person and make sure that they're that they have they're equipped with the information that they need to to, to make decisions if, if that is the person that that uh, if, if they don't have a litigation friend for example because they are on the right side of that uh, um, uh, that, that question as to whether somebody's got capacity to litigate and they're able to manage things themselves, they may well still need a lot of support in order to make those decisions. And that's that's where Laura and I and, and, and Charlotte, in our experience of working with uh, with injured people and people that have, have these brain injuries, we we're able to uh, to understand what uh, what uh, scaffolding they might need to, to help them and support them, make sure that they're uh, they're able to to be as independent as possible, and obviously, Charlotte, your your role um, uh, as deputy you, you, under the Mental Capacity Act, you've got to to look at things on a uh, on a decision time time specific basis, haven't you? And, and uh, that will mean you're involving P the the injured party quite a quite a lot in in what you're you're doing. Um, obviously, depending on the severity of their injury and and how how much they're able to be involved, but um, can yeah. you tell us a bit more about about your your assessment of, of mental capacity and the things that you will take into account? Yeah, I mean, with, within the role of, of being a deputy, you, you're quite right. The, the Mental Capacity Act 2005 is, it is always there and the guidance and obviously key to that in the second stage of that assessment is whether we, we assess the client to be able to retain that information and capacity you're quite right Beth is, is matter and time specific so as deputy we will always take the lead on you know the, the relevant medical professional whether that's a psychologist neuropsychologist neuropsychiatrist depending upon the, the diagnoses and, and perhaps the level of injury we will always defer to, to those to do the, the formal assessments we are always keeping capacity you know under review as deputy and you're right if we need to to deliver some information and, and take uh, the opinion of our, our client p which is always the case we involve them all the time we need to, to assess you know is this a good time to address them this with them and for them to make a decision it, it may be as simple as you know deciding where to go on holiday and, and paying for that holiday or it may be you know, purchasing a vehicle, uh, you know, for the, for the support team to get them about in. We need to assess, you know, are, are they well at that time? You know, do they have a, a urine infection or some form of infection? And we need to leave that decision for, for a better time once the antibiotics have cleared that infection. Um, you know, do we, do we address that, that conversation and decision at the best time of day? And how do we live, deliver that information? And we, we have to give P, the client, the claimant, as, as 
much information as we can and give them as much independence as we can to make that decision. And that can be an unwise decision. Obviously, they, they are perfectly capable of making us. We all are. Me, my uh, my uh, one is usually shoes. Um, but to give them as much information to make that decision. Um, you know, ultimately, the deputy acts in their best interest. So if they aren't capable to make that decision, as long as we've consulted with them and given as much to give them the, the power to make that decision themselves, we've done as far as we can and we continue to readdress that on an ongoing basis. Um, but ultimately we, we act in the client's best interest and we have to safeguard them uh, as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, but we, yeah, we have lots of examples of, you know, assisting the client to become as financially independent as possible. Some of the examples, you know, we act as deputy where clients are, are quite capable of receiving all their benefits into their account, managing their day-to-day -day finances, their household bills, uh, and they, they enjoy doing that. They want that financial independence and, you know, they're very capable of doing it despite whatever injury and, and memory loss they may have, but we keep a close eye on it still for them. But then to the other end, you know, there may be clients that are very financially vulnerable and they do not actually want to be involved in the day-to-day -day financial matters. And they are just simply happy that we, as deputy, deal with all that complexity for them, including possibly a personal injury award. Um, and they have a set amount of money per week, per month, however they prefer it. And they know they can spend that on whatever they need in terms of leisure activities or popping out or food per week. So it, it is very, very client specific. And we do have to, to take all their thoughts, feelings, their requirements and needs into account uh, and respect that really. It is, as you will see both of you, it, it is very, very different for, yeah. for everybody. I think it's something that, uh, you know, we, we have on our radar from, you know, really the first time we're ever contacted by, you know, a client or their family. It's especially when we know they've sustained this brain injury it's you know even in that first interview which is really important um first meeting with with a client you're assessing and weighing up how much you think that person can take on board what you're saying and you're also looking around and saying uh, who, who is around this person who, who could support them can they can they be supported to make their own decisions which with some help and advice or do they really need, you know, do they lack capacity and, and need a litigation friend like we've touched on? And so, yeah, it's, it's something from that very early stage that we're already thinking about. And we would try to get some medical evidence, as you say, from a, whoever's involved, a neurologist, a neuropsychologist, to help us formally assess that so that we can then, if they do lack capacity, put in place the relevant support and, and framework to to support them as soon as possible, um, really. Um, don't know if you've got anything to add, Beth, in terms of, uh, it's not just obviously the medical evidence, it's, it's other fa factors as well. Yeah, as I, um, as I alluded to, to earlier on, it, it's not just a case of what the experts say, although that's a, that's a big factor um, in terms of the diagnostic test and the criteria for, whether, for determining whether somebody lacks capacity. Um, there's also the, the functional test, which is, is, is more where we will be involved in, in trying to, to establish whether somebody can understand the information, retain the information, weigh that information up and communicate that information. Um, because, uh, as I said, somebody with a brain injury may well have uh, uh, have retained intelligence, may well be still able to uh, to digest this information, just won't be able to perhaps uh, communicate it, and they may well need some some assistance uh, in that regard. But they still do have capacity. So uh, it, it's a very complex issue, um, one that we could probably talk about for for a very long time, <laughs> but but we won't do today. But um, it. it it's very important that, that we as, as PI uh, lawyers, Laura and I, um, get it right, because if, if we don't uh, have a litigation friend, um, then the settlement can be unwound and um, uh, there's obviously uh, a lot of implications. We've got to make sure that we, we're getting instructions from the right person. So um, we will always take this, this assessment very, very seriously and look to see whether um, uh, somebody is needed and as part of the process we're also looking to see whether they need assistance um, with managing their property and affairs and that's where uh, Charlotte will, will be in, involved and we'll try and 
um, collaborate and, and get somebody uh, on board for, for the client as, as early as possible to, to make sure that they're able to, to manage their finances, interim payments, for example, during the lifetime of the case. Um, so that um, we've got the, the evidence that we need um, to, to ensure that they've, they've got the, the funds uh, to, to help them with the deputy ship, et cetera, for, for the rest of their, of their lives. So um, these are all really uh, very important um, decisions and um, something that we will um, be very careful to, to make sure are addressed at the earliest possible opportunity, um, wherever there's reason to suspect that there may be uh, some issues with, um, with capacity and so memory being a, a large feature of that. Mm, lovely. Well, I, I think unless anybody's got anything else to say, that was that was what we were going to, to speak about today. As, as Beth says, I mean, this is some, I mean, capacity alone is a huge issue, one which we could spend another hour talking about, you know, borderline capacity fluctuating capacity. It's, it's huge. But today it's been really helpful just to, to talk about, you know, the type of issues that, that our clients face, how we try to support them and you know how that plays into the, the claims and um, in your support as well Charlotte so thank you very much for both your time yep. it's really really helpful and uh, thanks again thank you thank, thank you, you. Yeah, really good to talk to you both yeah.